So here's the uh, quick introduction about Andrew. So Andrew is the head of uh, technology and innovation for ZT UK, joining the group back in 2009. In his role, he has worked with major clients across government and private sectors. He's also an active member of Sudet Labs and is the country lead for UK. He is an enthusiastic speaker at events and commentator on using technology for benefits of business and has a special interest in AI, automation, and agile and DevOps. So in the UK, he leads the technical practice working with our staff to ensure they have the skills to be successful in the modern changing world. He also works with the sales and customers to understand their business needs and to craft the te technical solution that develop real measurable value to them. So over to you, Andrew, to let us know about a different perspective of test and test data through this presentation and webinar. Thank you so much for the introduction, Topeka, and thank you for everyone who's joined today and for everyone who Wow, wasn't that a surprise what happened last week? So I'm Andrew Fullen and I'm based in the sunny UK at the moment. And over Christmas, I was faced with the task of how on earth do I get data to be an interesting subject as it comes from the World Quality Report? And as often happens over Christmas, I caught the flu, I was stuck in bed and I was sat watching Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Um, I couldn't get up to change the TV, so I had to. I had to watch it. I was forced to. That's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. But as it went through, I realised how much what was actually in there was actually useful for testing, for the ways that we work in, especially as there was a few quotes that went on, and I started thinking. How would Jane Austen have gone about if it was Pride and Prejudice and data? A bit like um, Pride and Prejudice and zombies, but with more data, less zombies. And Pride and Prejudice, if you don't know, it starts with quite a well-known quote. And in the first draft, I came up with the idea that really what she was trying to say was, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a tester in possession of a good application must be in want of test data. And that was obviously rewritten after the first draft and became something along the lines of you know, a man in possession of a good fortune is in need of a wife. But I think it's really um, trying to sort of get the feel of why data is important to us, because a lot of people tell us data is important. And I think pretty much anyone listening to this feels that data is an important subject. For the last 11 years, we've been doing the World Quality Report. We've been asking questions about organizations around the world about data. How do they do it? How do they manage it? How do they ensure they have enough of it? How do they make sure that the testers have enough of it, that the developers have enough of it? And it's a question that we've been asking every year. And I've been following that because my career with Sujeti maps that of the World Quality Report. I came on board just as the first one came out. So I've, I've always followed it with a lot of interest. And we, we see people in the media, they'll talk about data being the new oil, the most valuable substance on the planet, which basically means that they actually regard us as a lot of decaying little creatures that they're going to make money out of. And yeah, it's, it's important, we need it. But do the actions of everyone actually sort of um, match you know, ac actions are supposed to speak louder than words. And yet, when we look at the World Quality Report, we've been doing it for over 10 years, and data is always one of those things that comes along and people say, yeah, really important, need data. And what are you doing about it? Oh, well, and then the tumbleweed moment happens. But we're starting to see some improvements in there um, over the last few years. And that's some of what I'm going to go into today. Because th there is an improvement, but it's probably nothing like we need it to be. And yet, to develop, we need data to test, we need it to operate, we need it to do our businesses, we need it. Computer systems without data are meaningless lumps of code that can't really do anything. So we've got to do something about it. And now with things like GDPR in California, the data privacy laws that have been enacted, and elsewhere in the world, there's a much greater acknowledgement that data is important good data is important, that we are compliant with our customers' needs, with their customers' needs, with any regulation, with any sort of 
government frameworks that we have to operate in and also to maintain trust of customers of users that if we are using data it's appropriate that we're doing the right thing with it that we're not just going into live and taking all of their data from it but you know that that can happen now if anyone doesn't know on the left we have colin firth as mr darcy and this is one of the scenes that always gets cut from the reenactment but you know one of mrs bentley's daughters does come out and say that, you know the data is very important so we, we need to be able to take the recognition that people keep telling us every year that data is important and do something with it and to do that it's probably good to understand where we are with the problem what are the challenges that people face and how does that actually relate to how we as Sujeti, as Capgemini, as consultants, as good citizens of the world can actually help make it work. So when we looked back um, 2017, 2018's report, we had between about seven and 17% of the organizations that we surveyed were doing something at least to try and sort of help with test data. This year, it's better. We're up to about 18 to 24%, depending on the questions that were asked. But that's still roughly only one in five. And in Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Bennett has five daughters. And we found that of the companies that we spoke to, only one in five of them is doing enough to provide test data of the appropriate quality at the appropriate time. So that's only going to be enough to support one of her five daughters. You know, and how do we decide who gets the data? So let's have a look at what people have actually been doing for test data, for generating it, for managing it. So coming up, number one, the spreadsheet. 24% of the people that we spoke to over the last year of research are using spreadsheets to try and generate test data when they come along to do unit testing or system testing or user testing or live-like testing, which of course means that you know, 76% of them aren't even doing that as a minimum to get themselves some data. One in five organizations is copying the data from live. Now, in Europe, we've got the GDPR. So it would be good that that's been used and anonymized. And I'm going to assume that everyone who is doing that is, of course, um, doing it correctly. And that is what was hinted at from the way people responded to us, one in five of them taking data from production and doing some anonymization on it. But that still leaves them with the situation where what they're going to have to do, go through, find a record, can I use it? Yeah, that's near enough to what I want. And then they've used up that data and they have to find the next one and the next one. One of the things that we found over years of these reports and other reports and elsewhere in the industry is that when it comes to testing, people only get 70% of the data that they need to fulfill their tests. So even if you're one of those one in five who've got the data, you may only have 70% of the data that you need to do the testing that you felt was important. Using data virtualization tools, one in five, going out there doing a tool, maybe like Data Maker, maybe like one of the IBM tools or anything like that, and using that to generate the data against some behaviors of how they understand the data is stored. Copying the production data unchanged. 19% of the people reported that they were doing that. Now, as we've got a geographic spread across the whole world for the World Quality Report, that does make a certain sense. And with those who are copying the production data and then anonymizing it, we're probably not in as bad a way as it looks, but it's still a long way from what's probably ideal and what we would like as test professionals and what our customers and end users would expect that we would be doing. And then we come to the old perennial, creating data every time you need to run it. 18% of people are doing that. And that probably means that 80% of people aren't even managing to get that done. 20% of people use so in-house tools to create data, maybe SQL scripts that they keep running. And then we have the, well, we just reuse the data that we've been using all of the time. And that's an approach in about one in five of the respondents that we got. And then actually going out and buying particular tools to address a problem. That's the one area that's seen some real growth in the last year, up to nearly 
And that always gives us an opportunity as well, because we have data experts who understand these tools, how to extract the data, how to model it, and how we can use that to help our customers. But when we look at the data, we aggregate it, we, sl we slice and dice it, all of those sort of things, we're still looking at about three quarters of the organizations don't have a rigorous or even a slightly rigorous approach to test data. And that's not great because, you know, you get it wrong. Once you lose that good opinion, it's gone for good. And Mr. Darcy, our users, the end customers, once they lose that trust in what we're doing, once they lose that confidence that we're doing the right thing, that the software is doing the right thing, that as organizations we're doing the right thing, you know, it doesn't come back. They'll go to someone else. They'll go to another consultancy, they'll go to another provider, they'll go to another website, a different app. The ability to change your supplier is easy. Now, in the UK, many there was a, a duelist chain called Ratners, and there's a famous quote that often crops up in business books. Ratner was um, being interviewed, and his products were cheap, they were cheerful, but you know, they hit a really good target market. And then he said in an interview, basically, and I apologize for language, our stuff's shit. And the newspapers, which had laughed about this before, suddenly decided they didn't like him and they went after him and they started killing the confidence. You've just bought your beloved an engagement ring. It's from Ratner's. And the newspaper saying, quote, it's shit, unquote. Doesn't do an awful lot for your confidence. Doesn't do an awful lot for your customers' perceptions. And roughly within a year, they ceased to exist, and they were on almost every high street in the UK. It's still one of the strong examples of how easy it is to lose good opinion and how hard it is to walk something like that back because poor performance, bugs, goodness, if you actually breach confidentiality of the data, that stuff's so hard to walk back. Social media allows people to shout about it and rant about it far more quickly than we can respond as organizations to say, hang on, that's not the case. And people will listen to the negative. So if we have an approach that manages good data, we can identify poor performance, we can identify bugs. If we don't have the data, we're not going to have the bugs found, at least not most of them. Performance, how many times have you had a mobile app that it takes forever to do something? You delete it, download its rival, off you go. So we need to make sure that we're in a situation that we understand why data is important, that we communicate that to our users and that people can actually sort of then come to us and we can tell them how they can create this data. You know, and also data is far more than it ever used to be. The volume of data is increasing, whether the information content is increasing at the same level, I'll leave to the experts to decide. But now we have the social media data that we may have to create. We may have other um, things, you know, app reviews that we have to test against, transactional data, IoT data. All of these things can come along and need more data to be built, more data to be generated, more data to test things. And we don't have more time to do it in. So the faster that we can automate the data creation, the faster that we can use that in our testing, turn things round. And also, if we've got all of this data, then one of the things that we're going to have to face is, you know, what happens when we run out of it? What happens with the environments? You know, we can get an environment, we can build an environment, but really that environment should be coming with the data. It should be coming with everything that we need to test. The more that we can automate the environment deployment and the data creation at the same time, the better the situation is, the more we can do in less time, the faster we can iterate, the faster that we can get changes out there, the more responsive we can be, our customers can be, and the better end user experience that they get. And ultimately we get as well. You know, th just think about the last time you went on Twitter and suddenly saw something trending. It doesn't often tend to be good news. You know, it's, it's the fraud protection, great example. You know, your credit card comes up and says, oh, we've decided that there's something odd with your data. How do you actually get that data? How do you make sure that those rules are going to work? Do you just sort of put your credit card details in there, discover that you're now blacklisted by every credit card agency? Or do you sit down and plan out a proper approach, a proper way of managing all of this? You know, and what it means is for us, there are 
many, many things that we can do. And with the drive to Agile, with the drive to DevOps, there is so much more that we have to do and data is key to it. I'm not going to bury you under large amounts of facts and figures in the rest of this presentation. What I want you to do is think about what can be done with data. What, where you're short on it for the moment? What sort of conversations you can have with your customers, with your other users, with your colleagues about why data is important and how we can help them. We can reach out and look at what they're doing in production. Are they GDPR compliant? Can we help them masking the data from live? Can we identify synthetic data that can be created in patterns that allow them to do all of the testing? An example I've seen in one of my customers is that the test data, when it came to the end users to sign off, was, quote, disappointing. And this is a heavy engineering company. And the test data was the equivalent of let's build a rubber duck, as opposed to building something that weighs hundreds and thousands of tons. And yes, it's, set, it's um, matched what we needed to do from a testing point of view, but it wasn't convincing. We could go and say, well, it tested this case and this case and this case. But all the users saw was we built a rubber duck and they built large turbines and engineering equipment. So it's not always just the volume of data, but it's how realistic that data is to what your customer needs to do. Obviously, you don't want everyone to have the same postcode if, or zip code or postal address, because if you've got a relational database and in almost every certain stance you will do, then your database is going to cache that postcode. You're going to get wrong performance. So we need to make sure that we have good distributions. We need to make sure that if you were doing, say, insurance claims, that you've got a good distribution of how their population of users match, how their claims match against that, so that we can do all of the paths that we need to do and that we test the things that give the most benefit soonest for them. You know, I'm hoping when we come to next year's World Quality Report, and the planning for that will start in the next month or so, the interviews will start, that we see by the time that we come to the end of November this year, that we will see more of an uptick in how people are addressing data. We're seeing hints of that now, but what we need to do is get out there, evangelize about the fact that data is important, that we can do it, that it will help on your transformation into an agile organization, into a DevOps organization. Good data that's generated when you're building your systems, Building them every night will link that into your functional automation, into your performance tests, your security scans. All of those things are important. All of those things can help you do more. We can go and do more value to our customers. And that means at the end of the day, we, we get more money as an organization. The customers stick with us because if they can stick with us, they're getting what they need. Why do they need to go elsewhere? So take the message out. Data is good. We can help you. Let's have a conversation. Have a look at the World Quality Report. Have a look at the sections on data and other parts of it as well. It gives you good graphs. It gives you tools that you can use to have those elevated conversations with people. You can hear when people are talking about, I don't have enough data. What am I going to do? Well, we can reach out. You can put us in touch with one of your sales team, one of your country leads, um, your manager or even yourself can have that conversation with them and sort of say, well, here's some examples of what we've done. Here's some cases similar to the one that you've got where we've been able to deliver this. It might be in the government, it might be in the financial, it might be in insurance, it might be healthcare, or any other organization, retail, for example, or even you know some of the sort of more embedded systems that we work on these days where we can sort of say, here's a real value case that we brought a real example of how good data policy can improve the quality of testing, improve the quality of the experience and deliver things sooner with a greater degree of confidence in what we want to release. Now, I'm not going to use the full hour for all of this. I try and keep these things relatively short and just give you some ideas to think about. And what would be really good is go and read the World College Report. In the meantime, see if there's any questions that you would want to actually sort of um, ask. And quote, by the way, from Jane Austen on the right, is a real quote. The book itself doesn't exist, but I think maybe if it was around today, Jane Austen would be writing DevOps manuals. 
I think it would be a really good field for her. We wouldn't be having Helen Fielding, we wouldn't be having all of the sort of diary type books. We'd have Jane Austen, she'd be an IT, I'm quite sure she'd be a tester. So, Topeka, that's my summary of what I wanted to bring about the World Quality Report, hopefully get people interested in there. Now, if there's any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Sure, Andrew. Uh, thanks for that uh, different perspective and letting us know how Jane Austen can be a good tester. I, I think she's an excellent tester. If anyone ever actually wants to spend a little time, look at the quality of how she actually writes and constructs sentences. There's no ambiguity. She's very careful on her word choices. If nothing else, if I start seeing um, proposals, test strategies that come in as well written as a Jane Austen novel, I'm going to be a very, very happy tester. <laughs> right. So, attendees, uh, please feel free to let us know about your thoughts, your queries and questions to the speaker through the chat and Q&A sections. And we shall be glad to answer you that. And I will have to say, I can't actually see the chat window while I'm sharing at the moment on my laptop. So, if anything does come through, um, please let me know, Topeka. And for anyone out there, please ask me a question. I'm going to feel really sad and lonely if no one asks me a question. Doesn't sound like anyone's going to ask us any questions, does it, Topeka? Uh, no, probably we should give them some time. I think so. They're probably absolutely overcome by the quality. Or they're deep in thought about how they can actually take the ideas about data, about logging on to the World Quality Report site, making sure they've got an electronic copy of that so they can have those conversations. And sometimes those conversations can take years before they actually have a result. I have a case yesterday where somebody responded to a post I did back in October and we got an introduction for them from Germany to somebody in the US now in Boston to have a further conversation in a couple of weeks time. So these ideas eventually will lead to something. And if people find themselves not having the time or wanting to think about it and then ping me later with any questions or thoughts about it or recommendations as to the next author that we do our podcasts in. Maybe we could do a Jack Reacher report for the next one. Whoever's doing that, Topeka. You know, we can do a, a Jack Ryan type um, in the style of. Yeah, I can do. So if there's no questions, then. I'm going to say is thank you all for listening. Thank you for attending. I hope there has been some use for this um, for you. And, you know, go out there, have a very good day and have a good test. Yeah. Thanks all. Uh, thanks for joining. And in case of any queries, uh, please feel free to let us know um, through the email. So we shall be glad to take that questions and answer uh, uh, through the email to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much and have a very good day. Cheers, Rick. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for taking.